Hey everyone, welcome to another Go With The Flow. My name is Robert Fedoric. It is so good to have you here. In this series, I am building full flows and doing minimal video edits so you can get to the content faster. In this episode, we are going to be talking about building custom flow actions. And I love building custom flow actions because it does two things. It takes stuff that a developer would normally have to do, and it makes it more accessible to people who aren't developers, and it makes it reusable. Now, if you think about the last episode, which you'll be able to see right about here, we created a flow in order to create automatic status reports. Now you can imagine wanting to put some kind of aggregated information into those status reports, like for example, the total cost of all the unmitigated risks that would involve summing a currency field. And while a developer is perfectly able to build a flow variable and have a script run it, what if I've got four or five developers all building the same kind of logic? I'd really rather encapsulate that into one reusable object that doesn't need a developer to wield. So in this video, the, the core case will be a action that will allow us to aggregate data in a similar way that Glide Aggregate does in a reusable fashion that doesn't need a developer to wield. We're gonna do all the hard development once and only once and package that into a flow action. Okay, let's just review the setup. We want a flow action that behaves a lot like a glide aggregate script. We don't want developers developing a glide aggregate script every single time, and we want this wielded by people who aren't developers. So the idea is that this action will be fed a table, a condition, and a field to aggregate, and it will return all the different aggregates that are available had I used that script. So we go to our flow designer home and we go to actions tab and we click new action and we're gonna call this the aggregator. And because I have a lot of different versions of this, I'm gonna call this the showcase. Submit. All right, hopefully after this video, you won't be as intimidated as I was in building flow actions. It takes a little bit of getting to know the interface and then once you know the basics, it comes pretty easily. But a flow action needs a couple of essential things. Number one, it needs input. What is it gonna be fed from your other parts of the flow in order to do the things that need doing? And then it also needs output. So this action is gonna take stuff in and do stuff with it and then output some stuff. Now, what really threw me for a loop is that there's inputs and outputs at every stage of this game. And you're gonna see what I mean in a second. But remember our setup, we wanna be able to feed this thing a table, conditions, and field and then something is gonna aggregate that. So let's just worry about the inputs first. So the first input I'm gonna create is a table input. So let's just call this table. We're gonna give it the label table and then it will automatically create a name for us. And what type is it gonna be? It is going to be a type called table name. And we're gonna make that mandatory because none of this will work if it doesn't know what table to do an aggregate against. Let's create another input. We're gonna call this conditions. This is what I love about inputs on the actions is that it's basically any field type that's in the system and there's such a huge variety and one of those things is a condition field. So all the condition builders you've seen on your list view and your business rules, that's available to you as a variable type in the actions. Sweet. So we're gonna take conditions. That's also gonna be mandatory. Uh, the trick with conditions though, is that we want them to be dependent on the table that we select. There's no sense putting conditions and trying to look for conditions on locations if the table that you picked is a task table. So let's hit this little downy arrow here to toggle the advanced options. And we can make this dependent on another input and we're gonna make it dependent on the table input. All right, the third input we're gonna need is field. And this is where, mm, I really wish it could have been a graphical field selector, but I just haven't found a way to do that in Flow Designer. If you can find a way, please put a comment down below or reach out. I would love to have you on a video so you can show the world how you got that to work. But we're just gonna say field, it names it field. What type is that gonna be? It's gonna be a string and it's gonna require that whoever invokes this action knows the database name of the field that they are called. And this must also be mandatory because uh, we need it for the calculations to work. Now we have the inputs, we're ready to go to the next step. All right, so the next step of flow actions is um, steps. 
And the way you invoke a step is you see this little plus sign between inputs and error evaluation. We're just gonna click a plus sign in there to add a new step. And you will see that there is a lot of different possibilities in here. Highly recommend you just explore this and think about the possibilities of what these actions can be built to do. You can also chain these together. So a single action can do multiple steps. Again, this is gonna be a simple action. We want a simple step with maximum control. So we are going to pick the script step. Here we go with the script step. I highly recommend that you change the name of this step to give somebody an idea of what it's actually doing. So I'm going to just call this aggregate script. Don't need to worry about its required runtime environment because you can have it pass through mid servers, all kinds of cool stuff, but we're just gonna do a, a simple instance. Now, this action is asking me for inputs. But didn't we already declare inputs back in the input section? Yes, we did, but you have to think about it this way. Every step of the flow action might need something different. And so on step three of a flow action, you might need an output from step one or two. So it's not necessarily the same outputs that we defined at the start. In this case it is, but in your adventures, maybe you'll find a case where you need an input that's the output of a previous step. So what I'm gonna do to make this super simple is just match the inputs here. So I'm going to create an input. I'm going to call this table and its value is going to be the table from our input variables. I'm going to create another variable. This one's going to be called conditions. And you guessed it. We are going to drag the conditions value from the input variables, the same name. I've had some trouble dragging and dropping these conditions. So don't be afraid to use this data pill picker I'm going to go to inputs conditions. There we go. I'm going to create a third variable. It's going to be called field. And you guessed it. We're going to use that data picker. Go to the inputs and pick the field input variable. So now the inputs to the script step in our custom action are being populated by the inputs to the flow action. All right, now let's get down to the scripty bits. And you just imagine in your world, you are building this with your scripting knowledge, but then everybody else after you doesn't have to have scripting knowledge to get this done. This is a beautiful thing about it. And let's take a look at the code. So it wraps this step in a function and well, it has two parameters, inputs and outputs. This inputs parameter is coming from the inputs of the step, not the inputs of the flow. That's why we went through the trouble of matching the inputs of the step with the inputs of the flow. So this inputs is grabbing this object's data. The first thing we're going to do is declare a couple variables here. I'm just going to copy this from another script that I know is working. So we're going to declare a variable of input table and that's going to pull from input inputs object, right? We're just coming up here and pull the table variable. Same with input conditions is going to be equal to input dot conditions dot two string. Now, if you've taken a close look at business rules before and using stuff with condition builder there, you'll notice that when you write a business rule, it saves the condition as an encoded query. So we're coming in here and we're saving that conditions field to a string. And that's just to make sure the service now knows, hey, just output the encoded query. Don't think that there's any hard carriage returns or anything in there. And I, I did have some trouble with it interpreting carriage returns. So just it's a good idea to force this to a string. We're also going to declare a field called input field. And that's no surprise going to take the field variable from the inputs that we declared on this step. Okay, so if you've ever built a glide aggregate before, the next step is going to be pretty obvious. If not, I'm going to have a link in the description for how to do glide aggregates. We're declaring a variable called AG. It's going to be a glide aggregate object. A glide aggregate object requires a table. Where are we going to find a table from? Ah, uh, yes, the input table variable that we just declared earlier. So we're going to drop that in here. The next thing we have to do is find out the conditions uh, that we're going to conduct the aggregate on. Where are we going to find conditions? Of course, we've gone all through all that trouble to get the conditions into this script via the inputs of our aggregate script step from the inputs from the flow action. Okay, and I'm, I pumped that into a two string so that I can then pump it into this add encoded query so that acts as my conditions. We also want to set grouping false because we don't want to group these aggregates unless you want to do a ton of work meddling around with the outputs of this script. Then we put in all of the aggregates. We're adding an aggregate for, for all the aggregate types. 
count some average min, max, and uh, standard deviation. Uh, if you want more information on standard deviation, I'm gonna have a video popping up right about here. Be sure to check that one out. Standard deviation is super, super awesome for finding out how accurate your averages might be. Okay, now we need to, something to do something with all this stuff. So let's just put this if statement in. So this says, if there is a next in this AG object, now we want to start pumping out outputs. So I'm just preemptively saying outputs.count, outputs.sum, outputs.average. And then again, if you know about glide aggregate, you're just saying get the aggregate that I just added up here. So we're gonna get the aggregate of count via the input field, aggregate of sum for the input field, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I have kind of skipped a step. I've gone ahead and started defining outputs, but I haven't got those outputs slotted. So that's gonna be the next thing that we do. Okay, the custom action has inputs and outputs. We know that already, but so too does every step. And we've already seen in this step where we have, the step has its own inputs, that we've matched to the inputs for the entire flow action, but the step also has outputs. And this is really important if you're gonna chain steps together because step one's output might set the stage for step two and its input variables. What we need to do is make sure that our steps outputs are clearly defined. At the bottom of the step is this section called output variables. And what I want to be able to do is use this action and just have the sum, the count, the min, the max, all that already predefined so I don't don't have to use say a, a transform to get that data out of it. So, so what I'm gonna do is just create a variable here. We're gonna call this one count. Now I could output this to a string. I wanna output it as a decimal though, because who knows how this data is gonna be used. Maybe someone's gonna take the sum total of all the risks and multiply it by, I don't know, the tax. So we want all this to output as numbers that can be used mathematically down the road. So I'm gonna make that count make it a decimal. Now I'm going to create another variable. I'm going to do this for the whole set. Sum, that's also going to be a decimal. And average, that's also going to be a decimal. And so on and so forth. So now we have an action that has inputs and it has a step that has inputs and that step has outputs. So the next thing we have to do is define the outputs for the entire action. So we go to the output section and let's start defining the stuff that this action will present us. Create an output and we're gonna call this one count, not surprisingly, but it's a different count than the one we defined before because this is the outputs for the action, not the step. We're gonna make this decimals as well. You can see where this is going as I add another output for the sum and so on and so forth. Now I'm just gonna hit exit edit mode and there I've defined the outputs. Now I've defined the outputs, but I haven't said what to put in them. So we are going to take all the stuff that we defined in our aggregate script step and start mapping them to our action outputs. So let's go to our count, our sum, our average, and so on and so forth. You can really see now why you have inputs, outputs, and steps with their own inputs and outputs, because what if we wanted to have several different steps and the final output was math done on the different steps involved? So um, that's why all of that stuff is separated. And we're gonna give it a test. This is why I love Flow Designer. This test capability just can't be beat. I'm gonna click the test button. It asks us, not surprisingly, for the inputs that we asked it for, right? So let's start off with risk and let's put some conditions in there. We want the estimated cost to not be empty and we want the state of the risk to be one of pending open or work in progress and the field that we're gonna go off of is cost. Let's run the test, view the results, and we see in the output data that the average is 47.43, the count is 204, the max is this, the min, standard deviation, etc. We got different numbers, that looks really promising, but let's double check the data. So here I am on a list of risks in the thoroughly awesome next experience. And let's scroll down to the bottom where I've added some list controls and the average 4743, max 100,000, sum 96,000. Let's just check that back up with our flow designer. And we see the numbers are same, so we must have been successful. So now that I know that's successful, I'm gonna go ahead and publish it and we are going to give it a real crash test. Now, you remember last time we built the automatic project status generator and we're just gonna go into that flow 
and we are going to use the action we just created. So after it does all the things that it does, we are gonna add an action at the end. Let's call this aggregator. There's our aggregator showcase. And look at what it's asking us for, a table. Let's go risk a conditions. Let's go the estimated cost is not empty and state is one of pending open or work in progress and the field that we're gonna aggregate is cost. Now that we're done with that, let's add an action to log it. Okay, and the message is going to be sum of estimated risk cost is, and we are going to go to our action, which is action number nine. Number nine in the aggregator. Oh, look how nice that is. Count sum, average, min, max. Let's grab the sum, drop that in. Look how easy that is for non-devs to utilize. And they don't even have to worry about what in the hell a glide aggregate is. You've just made this way easier for people to build flows with now. But let's give it a test. Run the test, show the results, go to our log, and we see the sum is 967637 which is the same thing that we saw in our test of the actual aggregator. So we know that this action works. And there you have it, folks. Your first custom action doing a super, super handy glide aggregate utility. Now you don't have to have invoke your devs and you can give this action out to people who are building flows who aren't necessarily pro code developers. Super win for you. All right, one last thing, folks. I just want you to remember that I am just like you. I spent 13 years in the ServiceNow ecosystem. I've had many, many, many jobs in there. I know what it's like to want to get to the next level, uh, both in terms of culture and pay and whatnot. Whatever situation you're in, if you're trying to up your game in ServiceNow, uh, I do a little bit of recruiting on the side. So reach out to me at the email address pictured here and we will try and find you your next job. Also, if you are the kind of company that is looking for ServiceNow talent, what better way to vet the talent than somebody who has been in the same trenches? I am not gonna send you a pile of resumes that may or may not make sense to you, not gonna waste your time. I will only send you the resumes that I vet personally. Reach out to this email address right here, and we will see you on the next episode.